Hi, folks. I'm here with my friend Jeff Polari, uh, the author of Arcane Arcade, which frankly is the most interesting innovative adaptation of tarot I've seen in contemporary times. Uh, and Jeff is also adapting Arcane Arcade into an app. Good yeah. to be with you again, Jeff. Thanks a lot for that, Jason. Uh, yeah, I am really excited about that book that you just showed. It's basically turning the tarot into a game you can play with your hands, which means you can now share the tarot with other people. And it's all driven by synchronicity, which I think is one of the most interesting principles of the universe and consciousness where the two really come together. And yes, it will be an app soon. And that app will be free. People will be able to download basically the whole book and read every section and then play the game against their friends with the app and even play against uh, the tarot itself because uh, that it actually has that interactive relationship. So, yeah, I uh, appreciate that comment. I'm really happy to be able to have this opportunity to talk to you about your latest book. This is another one that you've put out it's so many recently in the last few years here. And I just, you know, again, you just keep pushing, pushing and pushing. It's like, you know, you're, you are the hardest working philosopher writer that I, you know, could ever have, have, have dreamed of. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be with you again. I look forward to playing with the app myself. Yeah. Uh, so we're basically going to focus today on um, Artemis Unveiled which is my latest book. It's what you would call a novella, uh, not quite the length and, and breadth of a novel, um, you know, as per Faustian Futurist and Uberman, something in between basically a story and uh, a novel length work. And nominally it's a work of science fiction, but of course it's really philosophy in the form of science fiction. And uh, at the, the core of the book is my first tangible, crystallized vision of what a Promethean utopia would be. Uh, so, you know, I've on a conceptual abstract level indicated the kind of principles that would organize a Promethean society, the kinds of, uh, you know, of ideas around which such a society would be structured. But I've never really, I don't want to say nailed down, but, you know, ventured in, in a very um, uh, clear way what my vision of different aspects of a Promethean social order would be until uh, in this book. And so I think, you know, some people might have had legitimate criticisms if in the back of their mind they were wondering, well, look, Giorgiani, what are you really aiming at? Uh, you know, give us some fidelity here in terms of what kind of alternative society you'd like to see. Uh, and so I've done that in this book. And in that way, it's a work that's comparable to, say, Plato's Republic. Something that should also be kept in mind, though, is that, you know, Plato had more than one alternative vision of, you know, the ideal society. He wrote the laws later in his life, uh, and it contrasts significantly with the social structure that he presents us with in Republic. And so it's not as if in Artemis Unveiled, I'm presenting some very dogmatically fixed view, you know, of a utopia, but at least I am ven venturing some more tangible ideas about, you know, what that society would look like and what the context for it would be in terms of the historical developments that elapse between now and then. There's a lot of material in the book that I really enjoyed when you talked about, you know, what kind of like things drive like the arts of this society, you know, what its political structure would look like what its challenges are, you know, and, and the rest. And what you said about Plato as well was uh, relevant because I remember when I saw a recent interview you did, you know, someone was asking you, why are you so specific? Why are you so tight about your, your vision? You know, what, and then you said, it's because I'm crafting a theory that I want to put forth out there so that other people can work off of it and develop their own theories and then challenge this. And then we can develop even a meta, uh, you know, the syn the um, synthesis of these two and then, and go even further. So this is definitely not a static vision, you know, and, and it's a, it's a progressive idea. It's evolving. And uh, yeah, so there really is, there is so many different directions to go from on that. I, I'm really open to going anywhere, Jason, 
wants to lead from there. Let me just make a couple of remarks in relation to the thing you were saying about um, how this work will be seen in the future. Uh, if you look at Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, it's clearly the case that, you know, the type of society that they envisioned has not materialized in detail. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't literally live in a world that looks like uh, the, the narrative of either of those sure. novels. However, it's also abundantly clear to me that both Orwell and Huxley in their own ways very uh, presciently and intuitively grasped certain fundamental structures of the world that we're living in um, and and structures that you know were not extant in their own lifetimes. So you know there are aspects of uh, 1984, such as thought policing and the attempt to control consciousness through the restructuring of language, the policing of discourse and so forth that have definitely materialized. There are also aspects of Aldous Huxley's vision of control through entertainmentism and um, the manipulation of hedonic desires and impulses, which have also materialized. And yeah. so, you know, these two works, Brave New World and 1984, are prophetic. But it doesn't mean that, you know, literally everything that, uh, you, you know, that you're going to do a point for point percentage analysis of how much of the content of those two novels materialized. Uh, you know, that that's not a kind of legitimate way to assess uh, how um, const constructively ahead of their time they were. And by constructively ahead of their time, I mean to be able to present a vision that allows for people in the future to become aware of certain potentially oppressive structures of their own society by looking at the narrative of these texts. And that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to do with Artemis Unveiled, that I'm, you know, I'm trying to sort of um, give people in the future a way to wake up to certain aspects of the control system that I believe they'll be ensconced in through presenting, you know, a uh, very vivid imagery and uh, a, a very sort of um, dramatic narrative that uh, reifies perhaps more subtle structures of their society that they wouldn't otherwise realize were oppressive. And that also makes them uh, aware of what other historical possibilities were at play, right? So, so mm. for example, another sci-fi novel that's relevant to, to bring up in this regard is H.G. Uh, Wells' The Shape of Things to Come which was adapted later into a big budget, you know, Hollywood sci-fi film. And there's a certain vision of how utopia is created by a scientific dictatorship from out of the violent chaos of a world war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the world of the shape of things to come is sort of contemporaneous with the, the era that we're living in. And in point of fact, the violent chaos of World War II was not used as an opportunity to develop that kind of a utopian society. So the shape of things to come can be read as a critique of our own time. Ah. And that's, again, something that I'm trying to do with uh, Artemis Unveiled. In other words, there are certain predictions that I make about events as they may unfold in the near future, but then there are also projections far beyond that. And one uh, aim of those projections is to demonstrate to, or remind people reading them in the future that history could have gone another way, maybe should have gone another way, yeah. uh, and, and to thereby galvanize them towards some kind of a revolutionary resistance of you know, the facts of, of the world as they've been established in their own time. And whereas you know, Wells and Orwell were doing a, you know, the, more of a dystopian, uh, scenario you've chosen to go more utopian yet the book is one of the darkest you've written written yet it, you know it's extremely provocative you know it's it's highly controversial yeah you're right i mean that this book 
although it is uh, my first attempt at elaborating a utopia, is also an utterly horrific story because in, in that way it's very similar to uh, The Shape of Things to Come by H.G. Mm -hmm. Wells because he's showing, Wells in, in that book is showing a utopia emerging from out of a global catastrophe. And so I, you know, set up uh, over the course of, let's say, the next in the next 30 years or so, a series of convergent catastrophes, which I've either written about or hinted at in some of my previous writings, a series yeah. of convergent catastrophes that ultimately set the stage for the um, construction of this Promethean utopia. And, you know, the context is extremely important. The chapter of this book that actually lays out the Promethean utopia is the fourth out of the book's five chapters. And so the buildup to it is very important because otherwise, you know, people could legitimately say, well, th this is an insane vision of, of society. This would never happen. Well, it wouldn't happen the day after tomorrow. I mean, our world as it is would have to be completely torn apart for this to even be a viable, uh, possible form of, of you know, sociopolitical organization. Uh, but in fact, I do think that our world is going to be torn apart over the next 30 years in all kinds of ways from, you know, geopolitical events like uh, Third World War and a second American Civil War, all the way to geophysical events like uh, another Carrington level solar storm yeah. or, um, you know, a pole shift, both a magnetic and a physical pole shift. So these are, you know, the kinds of events and the attendant tsunamis that would follow from that and so forth. These are the kinds of events that I depict uh, in the earlier chapters of the book that set the stage for such a radical reorganization of society. Yeah, and that's some heavy reading, you know, and it really could just be any one of those events, too, that could be big enough to have ramifications everywhere else. And on another level, too, in order to achieve that Promethean society, it's almost like it shouldn't have to be that way, you know? It shouldn't have to be that far down the road, you know? Like, we, like what happened with Nietzsche, you know, like he had talked about his ideas, you know, and no one read his work. He only sold 300 copies while he was alive. And then who got, who then who picked up his work afterwards? The Nazis, when his sister sold that collection to them. And, and then they did, you know, with his philosophy, some awful, terrible, you know, things, but they, they still, they used it. And at that same way, it's like, the people of today could use your message with how you've written it out in previous books without needing to go through those so many of those catastrophes, not to say they're all avoidable at all, but, you know, each one of them, you know, like each one of them is another opportunity for us to hopefully put the pieces back together in the right way, because that seems to me one of the absolute hardest parts about where we're at right now. You know, we go back to like the progressive mentality of Uhura Mazda, Smenta Mayu, versus Anger Mayu, the constraining mentality, when these this duality between the progressive and the constraining, literally giving us the definitions of like wisdom and evil, ultimately. Well, what's more constraining than how concretized society is today? You know, everything in society is an utter lock and step. And, you know, it's so hard to be past, you know, to be past where they're at today to you know be outside of that that very tight niche and the threads are getting tighter and tighter and tighter and so you know it there does seem to be that need for like uh you know a some kind of major shift to break that apart and then you know from and and then honestly I'm the type of person who sees like the possibility of many different competing models for for what reality can be ultimately allowing for us to have a more creative flourishing, especially since like the idea with the Prometheism that I think is so grand is like all it would take is one strong Promethean civilization to continue to push the, the direction that we're you know already heading with the technology and then change it to have the Promethean ethos to go with it. And that would be enough to pretty much like turn back around and then we'd be able to help the rest of this world society get back on their feet from you know the troubles that they're facing because you know all these a lot of these disasters that you're talking about you know they wouldn't apply to a civilization so much that's uh done what you recommended in promethean pirate you know if we had colonized the seas which you talk about you know as like one of the elements in this book if you have gotten under underground you know we you could get past some of those pressures and then turn around eventually 
and then use the gains that we've had to liberate humanity from you know the structures that that are still there and to what extent they're willing to receive that you know is a whole nother dynamic that would have to be kind of assessed at the time yeah i mean i don't want to reveal too much about the plot of the book but um i will say that uh central to my vision of the future in this book is the idea that i um first explored in Promethean Pirate of Prometheism going in the direction of uh, colonizing the outlaw oceans, uh, basically mm -hmm. establishing seasteads in international waters and both building underwater and also using the oceans of Earth as a base to launch deep space uh, colonization, not just exploration, but colonization of the asteroid belt the yeah. mining of which would generate tremendous wealth uh, as part of what I portray as a, a um, blockchain-based cryptocurrency uh, governed economy that is uh, effectively a revolt against um, a centralized, hierarchically managed global economy uh, that I see taking shape within the next decade or so. So in, in um, Artemis Unveiled, there is this uh, vision of how the United Nations is transformed into a world government at the end of the Third World War. And this uh, United, new United Nations system, this reformed UN led by China and Russia, basically establishes a highly controlled, centralized global economy. And uh, the Promethean movement breaks away from that by building a uh, blockchain-based cryptocurrency economy. And ultimately, once the asteroid belt is colonized and asteroids are being mined, there's a tremendous amount of wealth that is cycling back into that system uh, from you know, the, the exploitation of the asteroid belt. Um, and then ultimately, I am, I'm showing how the economy of the Promethean community uh, produces such abundance that it transcends the logic of both capitalism and communism. So that, you know, for example, uh, the communist idea of resource redistribution, redistribution of wealth, is only relevant when you have finite economic resources. Mm -hmm. uh, that logic doesn't apply to an economy of abundance. You wouldn't need a redistribution of wealth. So there's a there's an, uh, basically a, a presentation of a type of economic system that transcends uh, capitalism and communism and defies their common presupposition of you know, uh, limited resource base and finite economic industrial production. But I kind of got, got sidetracked. What I wanted to really say was that, yeah, going under the water in order to escape certain geophysical disasters like tsunamis that would be attendant to say a pole shift is definitely part of my vision in Art Artemis Unveiled, as is also getting far above the water. Mm -hmm. Iran is one of the most high altitude nations in the world. Um, you know, the Iranian plateau, the, the entire country is on a plateau called the Iranian plateau, which is uh, to start off with thousands of feet above sea level. Um, and so Iran is uh, particularly, um, it, it's in a position to endure and be particularly resilient in the face of uh, a really, you know, catastrophic um, global upheaval of the oceans and, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, you know, in Artemis Unveiled, Iran also plays a really key role as a bastion and fortress of Prometheism. Iran, of course, after the overthrow of the Islamic Republic, which is a subject that I get into the book as well, you know, how I think it is that the Islamic Republic uh, will wind up ultimately being overthrown within the next few years. That would be so great because, yeah, there is very little avenue for movement right now for Prometheism, you know, with all the with the directions that we've been that it's been trying to go. You know, the, that really does feel like, you know, with what Iran has been through history, you know, the abode of like where Zarathustra comes out from. And, you know, many of the greatest ideas from Greek society comes from out. Well, then, you know, if it happens, as, as you're saying, then, you know, it's really coming full circle where then it's Iran once again, you know, like it's like apparently one of the oldest, the oldest continuous nation on the on the entire planet. 
And so, you know, it would be just so incredible then if Iran was able to do what do what you talk about in this book. And, you know, it was news to me that they're that higher ele- elevation like you're talking about. And and that just goes to show like for me, I'm, a, you know, I study geomancy, you know, the way that, you know, different parts of the earth pick up different vibrations. And that that makes perfect sense to me, you know, based on what you talk about in Iranian Leviathan with, you know, the m- countless innovations that have come from society through, you know, ancient Persia. And uh, yeah, you you know, the way that you talk about it with the 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 way the um, you going underwater to then, you know, then go above that just reflects that that new motto de profundis excelsior, you know, the the ultimate from the depths, you know, will rise ever higher. And I think that really it goes in, in every which direction with that. And so, like, again, remarkably cohesive in, in the vision of it. That's what I felt reading this book was like this flows just exactly out of what you've written before you know it's just like it's like a it's like a you know crystallization just like you said all the chemicals they were all there you know and now they're kind of taking form they're taking a shape and uh yeah the newest part of the book like you said is that the definition of that new society you know that's where you get some really cool you know different glances at, at the different way things can go and you talked about for instance like being beyond scarcity. And of course, what you were describing right there with, you know, communism and capitalism being beyond that, that's the upwingers, which is the opening quote of of the book, the idea that we're going to be moving towards like a new cosmic dimension. And, and so, yeah, this is where, again, we really need to shake up the narrative that's happening today because it's so polarized between left and right when it really should be like, just put yourself 30 years in front now in the future you know, and what could be happening. And then, you know, let's just move towards that so we can solve these struggles. We can, you know, have everyone can have the means to, you know, not be so driven by scarcity. Because if you really think about it, you know, so much of human development is driven by that uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, people, if they're struggling at that material level, they don't really get to break out into, you know, the transcendent planes of self-actualization. And so in the society you describe, it really does sound like people, you know, like they're going to be self-actualized on on many different planes because they're also not only materially set, but they're also working with the spectral technologies of the future. And I think that it, hopefully it's not a spoiler to say it, but I think one of the main spectral technologies actually it appears in Uberman. So you can you can follow it there is past life recall. And getting really good at past life recall seems to be something that would, you know, if we could get to that technology where it's not just, you know, shrinks with like just trying to make a buck, trying to, you know, take people to a semi-conductive hypnosis, you know, without having proper, you know, feedback systems in place. You know, if you if you really did like focus on getting that type of technology set up, you could maybe pull off, you know, a, a real strong revolution in society. Yeah, past life recall is um, one of the key elements of the educational system that I describe in Artemis Unveiled. Uh, th- there's a lot of this vision of utopia that concerns how the education system is set up. I mean, for what should be obvious reasons, but I'll, I'll get into it uh, in a little, bo- a little bit more depth and detail. So between the ages of 13 and 15, I have the denizens of this society undergoing a process of very carefully uh, guided um, past life regression and integration of memories from past lives, which would be useful in one's present life in terms of, you know, a store of experience and, uh, you know, acquired wisdom. Um, But then also... I think it's the case that depending on what experiences you're undergoing in your present life, certain uh, things that you have um, experienced in past lives are more or less relevant to navigating, you know, challenges that face you. And so it would be a process that focused on what was most useful to remember, because presumably the denizens of this society have each lived thousands of lifetimes. And so it's a question of uh, retrieving those memories and um, uh, 
lifting those experiences that are most relevant to the challenges of the present life from out of the depths of the unconscious and into uh, conscious recollection and um, you know experiential awareness. So yeah, I, I portray that in you know uh, my description of the education system, which is really fundamental because uh, I actually depict a society that has no laws. And so in lieu of laws and a punitive justice system, this entire society is organized around the cultivation of ethos. In other words, character building and on an individual level. And also the ethos of a maximal trust society uh, where each individual from early childhood is inculcated with a sense not only of personal responsibility, but with a sense of vicarious joy in the flourishing of other members of her community. And so I, I talk about how, although there's physical education of various kinds, including martial arts and dance and yoga and so forth from an early age, the focus of the educational system up to say the age of 15 is actually character building. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more important than uh, the content of various disciplines. And of course, yes. this is a world where Neuralink exists and where you know specific information can be quickly downloaded into someone's mind, and also a world where augmented reality and virtual reality make it possible for people to train uh, in the practical knowledge of various tasks with high fidelity. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's a lot easier to learn you know, um, not just information, but to learn skills. Uh, therefore, the focus of the education system is actually kind of a, a depth psychology engagement with the relationship between the unconscious and the conscious mind of each of the children who go through this educational system so that they wind up uh, having the strongest, most conscientious and caring character possible. Um, so yeah, that's that's really the bedrock of the society as I depict it, uh, and I mean we could go into various aspects. Well, I yeah, I was gonna say that um, when you're talking about that, if that's really the focus, then you're also looking at a society where age doesn't mean what it means right now. A kid could learn skills that adults know, and in in that regard, I was trying to what I'm driving at is that you know, children could be, you know, teachers as well. I mean, there's a, the, if a child has a very strong level of integration with their unconscious, you know, you'll probably see different people who are really tapped in, you know, and then in the same regard, just applying it to modern life, so many people who are older are just utter children, you know, like, especially if they're really old, sometimes they just, you know, they never really move out of a certain age. And, you know, so you talk about character building. Um, I've done some studying of schooling because I'm practicing homeschooling. And, uh, you know, one of the ideas that comes up is the is the uh, that human beings are inherently driven to to become more. You know, it's like it's a fundamental part of our character. So, you know, your society, it talks about that. That's the cultivations happening there kind of. And it's a free society. So it almost is just goes hand in hand because. It's like the idea that if you have all these different tools, these, re you know, the resources, the teachers, uh, and then augmented reality, which is something, and then the different download tools, you know, people are going to be naturally motivated to be all that they can be and, and be something that's never been done before. I think that's really the main feeling tone that I'd like to see in that society is people, you know, bre breaking out in, and breaking into, you know, not trying to repeat stuff anymore because if information's all just totally available it's no longer about just synthesizing what's already happened it's about now now going on to to create something new you know there are whole fields and disciplines that may open up in a spacefaring civilization which has transcended the kind of conflicts that have defined most of our history thus far uh, like for and and this would you know this is by way of responding to your idea of children or young people in general learning in the course of their education to do things that have never been done before right and so mm -hmm. one field that I describe uh, in Artemis Unveiled is um, xenobiological epidemiology okay so uh, 
here's a world where due to what I call grain technologies, genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, due to basically si singularity level technologies and the ways in which they reinforce each other, all diseases have been cured on earth and inside the solar system. So wherever the Promethean community uh, inhabits from the depths of the oceans on earth through the asteroid belt and the Oort cloud, all known terrestrial and human diseases have been cured. Um, whether it's through germline genetic engineering or through nanotechnology or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But as we're expanding out into the frontier of deep space and in, in, engaging with alien life forms, even alien life forms that let's say we might encounter in the oceans underneath the ice of Europa, there will be alien diseases that we encounter that may affect human beings in as catastrophic ways as any disease we've had to grapple with throughout the course of history and contagions that might come back to the earth and yeah. you know uh unleash who knows what kind of pandemonium yeah. in in the entire ecological system of the planet and so there's yeah, this whole yeah. field that you know i describe you know of, of the you know xenobiology e epidemiology in the context of xenobiology Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and and actually to your point, there's this remarkable, probably the most mind-bending sci-fi book I have ever encountered. It's Philip K. Dick's The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, and that's one of the main things that comes up is it is a uh, you know some kind of uh, infection that can occur from uh, an alien life form, and it's not even a physical one. Okay, it's and it has to do with the structure of reality. Really, really highly recommend getting into that one because you know he's he's just so so strong even though he's so out there and uh yeah that's actually something that excites me a lot though because you know not only would there be the studying of like the risks that could come from these life forms but also you know the benefits like you know that's something that interests me a lot is like learning to communicate better you know maybe even like what we consider like the octopus is already kind of almost like a different form of life on this planet you know you talk about it in closer encounters that the you know octopus you know, has this uh, genetic structure that suggests that, you know, it, it didn't evolve naturally um, on this planet and it has all these incredible abilities. I mean, just a few of them, I just, you know, they can literally regrow their limbs, but their limbs are also like brains and they also, you know, can camouflage better than any other creature in the entire natural kingdom. And then they also have extreme personalities. You know, this is something that's really remarkable animals that have a high, high level of like personal awareness. Like you've talked about how, you know, they'll even do little digs on the people that care for them if they don't get good enough food and different ones have just completely different attitudes. And in other words, they have personalities. And if you're working at the level of personality, you're working at the level of like souls and, you know, telepathy is also a huge component of what they have. So I like that, you know, in this society, you know, those life forms as well have become integrated into the actual fabric of the society. Yeah, so in Artemis Unveiled, you know, octopuses have become part of the Promethean community. Uh, there has been a breakthrough in communication, particularly with, with several intelligent non-human life forms, namely uh, whales, dolphins, and octopuses. And the octopuses in particular, because they have a morphology that allows them to manipulate technology and to uh, basically, you know, effectively traverse the um, physical environment of humans. Mm -hmm. uh, the octopuses in particular have been really deeply integrated into the structure of the Promethean society. They, their tremendous telepathic ability which has been tested, by the way, and I discussed this in Closer Encounters, their telepathic ability and their uh, precognitive predictive power is used uh, as a consultative tool in planning by the Promethean community. So by breaking through to be able to communicate with octopuses, we gain then another source of uh, precognitive projection to you know, help for all kinds of planning and disaster avoidance and so on and so forth. And I have this imagery of actually octopuses sitting in councils together with, you know, various um, uh, Promethean planners and, and and 
And that's I, why we don't eat the octopuses, okay? I, I actually, I remember learning about this in Closer Encounters, about how intelligent octopuses are. And it was at that moment I said, I'm not going to eat any more octopus, no more calamari. And I honestly, I heard a voice say, Jeff, like right there in my ear. Like it was like, whoa, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, and, I'm uh, joke in the book in, in Artemis Unveiled about how we don't eat octopuses anymore. They eat with us. And so they're sitting in restaurants, basically, like eating their own stuff in pools, you know, stone pools and so forth, together with humans. And in any case, uh, and by the way, just after I finished writing Artemis Unveiled, I found out that the current um, breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, the current rapid advancements in artificial intelligence technology have led to a breakthrough in decoding whale clicks, whale language. Yes. And basically what they've done, long story short, is, and this kind of, it really boggles the mind. The artificial intelligence programs have managed to create sort of galactic maps of every way that a word can be used in multiple human languages. And they take these maps of all the ways that words could be used together in any number of human languages, and they basically uh, superimpose them on one another. And they're able to then translate between any human languages. And this is a kind of uh, technology that's behind like chat GPT-4 being able to take prompts in any language and you know give you back feedback in any language. In, in other words, it, the multilingual capacities of chat GPT-4 have to do apparently with this kind of linguistic mapping. And you know the tremendous diversity of human language that this can handle from the Indo-European languages, which have a certain structure, all the way to Chinese, which has a completely alien grammatical structure, the amount of diversity in the morphology of languages that this kind of artificial intelligence can map is such that when you put whale uh, song or whale clicks into the same program, it identifies a pattern and can start to figure out what the words are and in what sequence they're being used. In other words, words by which I mean units of meaning, you know, sort of. And uh, so this is happening right now. And they're thinking that within the next few years, this might actually lead to a decoding of whale language. And again, I found that out you know, shortly after having finished uh, Artemis Unveiled, where I predicted, in fact, this breakthrough does take place in the future. Yeah, and a lot of your works kind of have that compelling reaching through time, uh, you know, effect. And this whole idea of the whales being able to like the way that it overlays like the language, these large language predictive models, you know, when you're telling me about this, you know, it has to come to mind is the Tower of Babel. You know, the, the idea that we were already trying to create, you know, like a Promethean civilization that would, you know, ascend to the heaven. And then the gods just scattered us uh, and then caused us to be confused with different tongues. And, and then we'd be babbling, we'd be all confused. And so that's where this Tower of Babel comes from. So, you know, this type of technology then that is able to, you know, create this huge language, like this intergalactic mapping of language, you know, almost seems to me like it's like, it's almost like the kind of a harbinger of the apocalypse there where, you know, we're again, we're right where we were back in the Bible ages when we were, you know, pushing, pushing the envelope. And then, you know, again, the catastrophism that occurs from that is obviously a huge subject in, in your book as well. And then I just wanted to say one last thing is I really hope that we don't translate like Moby Dick into whale language. Let's not <laughs> put that back at them. No, just kidding. But really, I, I do find that a very Promethean novel. And again, I, I personally find that whales are, you know, extremely impressive creatures. They have four hemispheres. Uh, of brains and uh yeah i would i wouldn't doubt that they would be that we could actually open up a true avenue for communication and then actually last last thought is that um one reason why octopuses would actually be probably really good at predicting the future this is something i learned uh, again i was reading this book from i believe it's like ray naylor called the mountain in the sea and it's a study of like the way that octopus's neural framework works with communication like affects AI and also discusses like different types of warfare technology that are totally relevant to your whole works. But, uh, you know, their thing is, is that they don't have like a, a you know, a linear uh, 
neural framework. Like our brains were built up from like the reptilian to the mammalian to the human to the superhuman, I would argue. And that, you know, that just inherently poses us to be in a Promethean, you know, forward thinking mindset. But the octopus has like a ring shaped brain and then each arm is is spanning out in different directions. So, you know, with that kind of thing, maybe, you know, what they're not just predicting the future, they're sensing the many realities that could be happening all at once. And then, you know, that maybe they just get like a stronger feel in one arm. And then that one arm is the one that becomes more real, more realistic. And that would reflect like their hunting abilities and and such. And in Closer Encounters, I use the octopus in order to present a kind of microcosm um, of a super intelligent super organism uh, that had reached back in time from the future in mm. order to open up further evolutionary possibilities for humanity. Um, that was one of the main parts of yeah. my in Closer Encounters, and I come back to it in this book in a science fictional form where basically, as you were suggesting before, you know, we're in another Tower of Babel moment where singularity level technologies are affording us the capacity to um, determine our own destiny in the face of these archontic controllers, these devas or Olympian gods or Elohim or whatever you want to call them, the Anunnaki of old who, you know, play a key role in this book, uh, our singularity level technologies are giving us the capacity to, um, if not achieve parity with them, at least have a fighting chance against them. And so at the crux of this novel is the struggle of the Promethean community to resist a controlled demolition of advanced industrial society that is being fomented by these uh, archons or devas. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, they're using the engineering of convergent catastrophes to uh, beat us back into, um, if not a pre-industrial civilization, at least, you know, a, a very debilitated, backwards, neo-agrarian, quasi-feudal system. Uh, and the Promethean community is breaking away from that and resisting it. And it is being supported in that struggle by this superorganism, which in a way thinks more like an octopus than like a human being. Yeah. Uh, so an organism that I ultimately refer to as the Prometheon or the Aeon of Promethea. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, you know, at the core of, of the, the whole narrative in Artemis Unveiled. Yeah, it is. That, that whole concept really brings it like, the full circle with the way that that organism that operates like an octopus and you know the octopuses like i said they can literally regenerate a tentacle you know in in that process so that's kind of the creepy thing like i definitely feel the pull of that super organism as a helper but at the same time you know we can't expect it to do it for us you know and then i guess the the idea about the archons comes up and then what they do to create these disasters um you know to then that send everyone into this neo agrarian society i definitely i think you talk about it too in the artemis book that's actually that difference could be used by the prometheans to you know share these different technologies with the people who want to have a better life you know i i have actually you know moved off to the country based on the, um, the the kind of teachings that were put out by one of these, you know, archontic beings. I moved out and I'm, you know, I thought I thought I was going to make like paradise on earth homesteading. And I'll tell you, it is a nightmare when it comes to like the mosquitoes that I have out here. It is just absolutely hell. It's It's like biblical levels of mosquitoes to the point where there's no chill whatsoever. It's no so I, all those dreams are in the ashes just because of that one factor. And then on top of that, you're just working mercilessly on some stuff. I'm, I'm sure that I'll feel a lot better when I get the greenery really coming along, but I am just slaving away on this. And I feel like, you know, if I, there's a few technologies I could already think of right now that would make it uh, so great for, for making things better. And I can even talk about like, Dude, like you're talking about the AR and the VR, you know, it's like if I had like an AR situation with me where I could put on some glasses and it would like give me incredible hints about how to like construct the perfect garden or like, you know, identifying all the different types of plants that could be used properly to save my life, you know, like they just found out this chat GPT is passing the medical exam. 
better, you know, almost better than doctors, you know, which isn't saying much because sometimes doctors really suck, you know, and then suddenly you have this ability like you're like, okay, here's this small device. It's just a little bead that's this big, you guys, and I will give this to you and it'll help you solve all your medical problems. It'll help you synthesize medication straight out of what's right there, you know, but people, they're going to want that. And so it's really going to make it hard for you know any society that's still on earth that isn't on the promethean side to not eventually be won over by it just based on the fact that you know people i think are hedonistic in a certain way and they will want to have that that growth you know so um yeah what are your thoughts on that i think that would be the case but for the fact that there are going to be these engineered and convergent catastrophes um which afford traditionalism an opportunity to um, not just gain ground, but to become the dominant ideology of the planet. So another thing that I portray in Artemis Unveiled is how, you know, the uh, the more conser- not just conservative, but, you know, paternalistic, patriarchal, hierarchical ideologies in the world like Confucianism, Russian Orthodoxy, uh, Islam, unify under the banner of traditionalism or the perennial philosophy and that this becomes the dominant discourse in the world partly because of these engineered catastrophes uh, and the way in which these catastrophes are spun in order to advance the narrative that mankind's hubris uh, and sin against God and nature through the use of technology is what has brought these apocalyptic conditions upon us. Yeah. So so for example, one of the things which, I mean, I don't even know how much we should get into this given the medium through which this video is gonna be disseminated, but you know, there's a whole discussion of the consequences of mRNA vaccination for COVID. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, the, uh, let's just say the relationship that that has to an extremely severe depopulation which takes place in the world. Right. Good happen. And so, you know, I think that there are going to be engineered catastrophes that are spun in a Luddite direction in order to, in, you know, reinforce a Luddite yeah. discourse yeah. Uh, and prop up traditionalism. Um, and of course, the Promethean movement is attempting to resist that. Yeah, and I think that is a key part of your whole philosophy, um, where you are thinking three steps ahead, um, because you know people think, you know, like for instance. I was resistant to like the whole way that science has been imploded, you know, like so we don't have real science anymore. You know, we have scientism and it's like this dogma that's there and people think that's the end goal. We're just going to be pushed under it. Well, maybe they're actually just going to throw science under the bus one day and they're just going to say one big I told you so. And then, you know, because we haven't had of open fair discourse about these things because we're being so censored, you know, then that's all how to go. And these different, you know, uh, groups will come out and say, I told you so, you know, but at the same time, these people, they're not doing anything to change it. And that's the problem too. You know, it's like you've said before, this Prometheism is really the one movement that's really future oriented. And these other groups are, you know, they're, they're oriented towards like life after death or they're cyclical you know, or they're degraded in nihilistic or something, materialism, just like straight materialism. And so, yeah, that that's like, they, are, they aren't going to be the ones that are helping to drive the direction better, but, and they're being led in, in a certain way. And so, you know, the, it's actually, it'll be on them if they're not, you know, if that happens. And I wanted to say too, that like this idea of the perennial philosophy, I think it's really key that we break that apart because I just think that, you know, you've done it in Lovers of Sophia and throughout your works, the idea that, you know, wisdom isn't this static reoccurring thing. It's wisdom is literally progressive mentality. It's, you know, what's going to be, what's wise today isn't what was wise long ago. And we live in a completely different world than what we lived in long ago. And that's why the shape of the soul of humanity is the butterfly. You know, literally this idea of the transformational being is what we are. So no system that we've ever had before is going to suit what's going on right now here today. And people, they want to go to this perennial philosophy because of a kind of collectivism where it's like everyone wants to, you know, join in together and hold hands and say everyone's right. No one's wrong. You know, we we all are in this together. All of our revealed traditions are just saying the same thing in different ways. We all share one Lord 
Okay. It's, you know, one, we're all the, whatever you want to call the Lord, you know, you don't even get to have the spirituality. They have to have the word like Lord, you know, shoved in there because it's a slave mindset. People don't want the freedom that comes from, you know, what really what they, <laughs> this is what I, this is what I'm trying to drive at. People want that perennial philosophy because it allows them to check out. It allows them to check out from what's really going on here today. And the, what's really going on here today is a spiritual warfare. You know, there's an actual battle that's going on and people, they don't want to be accountable to that war. They don't want to not feel like, you know, that their, their reality is completely, you know, is safe just at like the ultimate spiritual level, you know? And I think that's like one of the main reasons why we're really struggling with it today is like Carl Jung said, people's main problem in life. What's their number one vice? He didn't say it was like sex or lust. He said it was laziness. People, they're lazy and they don't want to have to buckle down and deal with the uncertainty and and be different, you know, because that's what it is when you're outside that veil. You don't have the ability to just kind of fit in. You know, you have to be dealing with this kind of chaos all the time. And uh, yeah. They, and so last thing was that with that kind of mindset, you know, I do feel like if you wanted to talk at all about like the what happens with like the future military organization of your society, I found that that was like a really important uh, counterpoint towards what you're talking about with like the liberated aspect of society, because there is that that other side of it where, you know, all order, you know, there has been breaking free, except for in one regard, which is the chain of command. Yeah, so a number of points there. First of all, I mean, I've argued in other philosophical texts of mine um, that the perennial philosophy, which is at the core of traditionalism, uh, you know, left-oriented people tend to like to use the term perennial philosophy. More right-oriented people tend to like to use the term tradition, primordial tradition, whatever. It's the same thing. And you're, what you're going to see is a convergence, believe it or not, between far right wing people, people right of conservatism and left wing kind of Luddite hippie types. That is the convergence which is already taking place, which you're going to see over the next couple of decades. Uh, and I've argued in other philosophical works that the ontology and theology that's at the core of this perennialism is uh, it is mutually exclusive of free will and human self-determination. Any conception of an infinite and eternal God of an omniscient or omnipotent being, whether you want to call it Allah or whether you want to call it Brahman, and of the human being as a microcosm of that macrocosm, the logical structure of such a postulation does not leave room for human free will, individual autonomy and agency, let alone for creativity right, human creativity. Uh, so I've argued this in other works. And, you know, it's also the case that this kind of traditionalist uh, ontology and epistemology, if it can even be called that, lends itself to a, an ethical and political order that is extremely hierarchical. It's the pyramidal model of society, basically the old ancient Hindu uh, caste system, right, in one form or another. Uh, with the gods, or if you want to put it in, you know, Abrahamic terminology, the angels at the top of this hierarchy. And so, you know, uh, in Artemis Unveiled, I show how the United Nations is actually perverted into an institution that reaffirms the most regressive traditions in the world in the guise of the right of a people to democratic decision making, meaning majority rule, in the guise of unqualified freedom of religion, meaning you're free to be a Muslim and to practice Islam, and in the guise of the protection of cultures, the right of cultural preservation. And I portray this scenario of how China, Russia, and you know, by that time, the majority of, of uh, people in the world who are Muslims because of the demogra demographic explosion in the Islamic world, they use these instruments of the United Nations to actually undermine the liberties that were supposed to be protected by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 
and the UN perversely turns into an organization that it actually is retarding human development and is holding us back from uh, continuing to pursue progress. So the, the UNESCO, United Nations Educational Cultural Institution, is actually used in order to shore up and safeguard the most traditional cultures in the world. Uh, and then there's all kinds of extremely uh, prohibitive regulation placed on things like genetic engineering and other technologies that could give us parity with these uh, devas, with these Elohim that have acted as our overlords. So, and you know, before anyone thinks that I'm you know crazy for suggesting that China or Russia, uh, these non-Western rising powers, these you know these countries at the top of the BRICS uh, nations that are rising, would ever be leading the UN? Well, I lay out a scenario where that's plausible, where toward the end of the Third World War, France actually leaves NATO betrays the rest of the Western world and makes a separate peace with Russia and China. And France convinces the Chinese and the Russians and the Muslims to use the United Nations as the instrument for their dominance of the world, that they, they should legitimate their hegemony through the extant organizational structure of the UN, with France, of course, remaining a, you know, a key part of that. And so, yeah, uh, so the UN becomes this repressive institution for the institutionalization of traditionalism in the world. Um, and basically, you know, the the whole brunt of the Promethean movement is to resist that kind of regression. Yeah. Um, so then we'll, we still are going to get to that point about the military uh, structure of the future society. But just in regard to some of the stuff. Actually, you could, I'm come yeah. back to that now. Um, so, so the point you were making is a deeper one that has to do with the desire for a sense of abiding peace and stability, right? I mean, Islam means surrender. Islam means submission or surrender. And it means submission or surrender in the sense of like, you better surrender to us or we'll cut your head off. But it also means it in a more profound sense of your personal surrender of your will yeah. to the one, to God, right? Mm -hmm. To the omnipotent. And yeah. what that gives a person is a sense of abiding stability, where you're not ultimately responsible for anything. You can divest yourself of responsibility by recognizing that everything is the will of God, right? And hoping for God's grace somehow, uh, that you should be counted among the righteous rather than among the sinners, not ultimately through any effort of your own, but because God just, you know, conferred you with his grace. And you find this in one form or another in all of the traditional religions and all those yeah. religions that traditionalists consider to be quote unquote great world religions. So for example, you find it in Hinduism also in the form of bhakti yoga. There's the same idea of submission and surrender to, the, to Brahman basically, and recognizing that your own ego is an illusion and so on and so forth. And that worldview is fundamentally at odds with a worldview that embraces struggle and conflict as central to the cosmos, which is the worldview of Prometheism and a worldview that ultimately goes back in our written history to Zarathustra, but also to Heraclitus of Ephesus. And Heraclitus of Ephesus took refuge in the temple of Artemis for the later years of his life. And he vouchsafed his writings, which we now have only in fragments, to the priestesses of the temple of Artemis. And it's not an accident that he did that. It isn't just because he was living in Ephesus and the largest temple in Ephesus was the temple of Artemis, one of the you know, wonders of the ancient world. It's also because Artemis, which originally uh, in Iranian, Arta Amesha, she was the goddess of the Sarmatians, who the Greeks called the Amazons. Arta Amesha means immortal truth. But it's immortal truth in a completely different sense, rather, really, in a way, in an opposite sense, to the truth of Brahman or the truth of the unity of the microcosm of the Atman with the ma macrocosm of Brahman. Truth in the sense of Arta Amesha, the philosophical meaning of the name Artemis, is the kind of truth that Heraclitus is portraying in his writings. The truth 
that war is father and king of all, and all things come to pass in accordance with conflict, that all things are permutations of fire, fire ever living, ever changing its forms, right? Yep. This cosmos, no man or God did make, this cosmos is fire, ever living, ever changing its forms. And so Heraclitus has this vision of the cosmos as a fiery forge of ceaseless change, perpetual becoming, and perpetual becoming in the form of unending conflict and struggle, which yeah. is perfectly consonant with what Darwin, let's say, uh, discovered in the course of the history of biology. Even if Darwin's picture is a relatively limited, somewhat materialistic picture, right? Um, it's still hitting on something important about nature that then, you know, Nietzsche uh, thought about deeply in his philosophical work. And that, you know, I'm also embracing and trying to forward with Prometheism. And so this is really a, a, a uh, worldview that is antithetical to traditionalism and the, you know, perennial philosophy at the basis of it. Yeah, and I think that that martial mentality is actually, you know, I, I draw on the tarot like you guys used to have my book right there. Um, and that martial, that the idea of Mars, OK, it's actually it's like a fire uh, sign. It, the idea of the war and the fire, they're connected. And when I think about like why things would why would the cosmos be structured that way? It's because it gets you in the game, you know, it put your it gets your skin in the game. You know, if your skin's in the game, you're going to be, you know, forced to actually try and do more. Like I remember I started as uh, I have co-founded uh, a group called Student Seeking Spirituality in college. And we held seminars where we'd like invite people of different faiths to share their perspectives. At the time, I was definitely in the new age group. Uh, but, you know, still interested in the different I open minded ideas. And I remember we had an Islamic guy come in and he said that, you know, Islam was surrender and you weren't a Muslim unless God was on your mind all the time. No room for anything else. OK, so basically you're you're basically saying you can't have any other type of free will. You don't even get to consider other options for other terms of reality, you know, and I feel like the idea of the fire there is that like. We should be getting charged up. We should be exploding. You know, every one of us should be exploding into, you know, the fragments of who we are and pushing the bounds of this reality. And uh, yeah, I think that the idea that, you know, then moving forward, you know, like that we would embrace that side of ourselves to, you know, when, when like it reminds me of like Nietzsche of like we'll be capable of great good and great evil, you know, like there'll be this a tremendous range of experience that's there. And the opening quote in your book, again, talks from um, FM 230, the Iranian futurologist. And, you know, he's talking about how we'll be ex exploring this new cosmic dimension that will happen. And it's not I don't think it's just going to be technology. I think it has to be also a psychology of people who are have the ability for just so much love. And then also people who can also be like really hardcore when it comes time to be hardcore. Let me add a few things to that. So. Artemis. Is the goddess of the hunt. She's the hunts. Yeah. And that's a very brutal symbol. And also she's associated closely with nature, with animals and the forest. And so she's a goddess who reflects the character of nature as compared to civilized human society, right? And Arta in Arta Amesha, the Iranian original form of what becomes the name Artemis in Greek, Arta or Asha, the, in Old Persian, it's Arta. In the Avestan language of Zarathustra, it's Asha. Arta uh, meant cosmic order. And it was symbolized by fire. That's why in Zoroastrianism to this day, there are these ever-living fires, the fires that are never allowed to go out. Well, this is how Heraclitus symbolized the cosmos. I mean, it's, it's not incidental that Heraclitus was invited by Darius the Great to become the court philosopher of the Persian Empire. He declined, but that he was considered for that position at all has a lot to do with the fact that clearly Heraclitus is developing the idea of Arta from out of ancient Iranian thought, uh, of this cosmic order symbolized by an ever-changing but undying fire. And so this, this idea is, you know, 
at the base of the name of Artemis, who is the relentless goddess of the hunt uh, and of, and of, you know, struggle in nature, what, you know, we might retrospectively consider in Darwinian terms as evolutionary struggle. And so then when you talk about good and evil, right, great capacity for good, great capacity for evil, well, Nietzsche wrote that wonderful book, Beyond Good and Evil, where he begins to take apart this binary. And that deconstruction of the binary between good and evil is also at the core of my own work, uh, has been central to my philosophical project, where I think of things not in terms of good versus evil, which is how a traditionalist always wants to frame things, which, by the way, is totally ironic and absurd, because if there's an omniscient and omnipotent God or Brahman or whatever you want to call it, that entity is responsible for all the evil in the world. Be that as it may, <laughs> be that as it may, uh, don't look for reason from these people. Anyway, so be that as it may, what's fundamental to my thinking is whether something is regressive or whether it's evolutionary, whether something is, is uh, retarded or whether it's creative. Right. I mean, this is the fundamental opposition that Zarathustra set up between Angraminu, the constricted, uh, constraining, regressive mentality, and Sepantaminu, or the progressive evolutionary mentality. And Sepantaminu, together with Arta or Asha, are facets of Ahura Mazda, the mm -hmm. you know the the uh, Lord of Wisdom that you know Zarathustra has at the core of his thinking. And if you notice. I don't know if I've ever done this before on air or anything, but if you look at this symbol, first of all, obviously it's the cosmic fire, okay? Yeah, the Promethean so, mandala, yep. It is that fire that Heraclitus is, is talking about, the cosmic fire. But notice how each of the prongs uh, has two uh, tongues of flame, right? And the reason for that is to signal dialectical opposition. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. The cosmic fire is the force of progress. It's the fire of the forge of the cosmos, but its creative capacity and evolutionary power has to do with dialectical opposition, right? Yeah. Uh, which you, you see in the Greek idea of diabolane. Diabolane is a dynamic tension between two opposed forces. And it's where we get the word diabolos, the devil. Yeah. So, you know, reality, quote unquote, is diabolical in nature. And that has everything to do with uh, the place of the martial in, in my vision, uh, you know, of the future and Artemis Unveiled, how, although essentially you're dealing with a radically anarchical society, which has deconstructed the idea of law, because I, I get into this, you know, toward the end of, Prome of uh, Artemis Unveiled, of how civil, the idea of civil law was developed on the basis of the idea of natural law, and how natural law is a false human projection, that there are no such things as laws of nature. There are only habits and tendencies in nature. In any case, uh, although there's been a deconstruction both of scientific natural law and of the civil law that was modeled on it, and we're dealing essentially with a radically anarchic society, there is still, as you said earlier, a chain of command. And what holds, besides the educational system that shapes the character of Prometheans from childhood onward, from infancy onward, what holds a society together, uh, you know, in a defense against its very real enemies, is this military structure. And so there's a kind of total mobilization of the society, which isn't to say everyone serves in the military, but everyone is, is capable of doing so in that society. Uh, and, and there is an, an effective tactical chain of command, which always exists. And so rather than a president or a, a prime minister or a monarch at the head of the society, the person at any moment ultimately responsible for uh, strategic decision making, especially in a state of emergency, is the admiral of the Promethean Navy. So that's how the, the society is, is structured. And I do make a remark in there, which is interesting, you know, um, uh, for readers to look at. Uh, I make a remark that's sympathetic to the Olympians, that's sympathetic to the Devas. 
where I note the fact that they criticize the Promethean society by claiming the only reason we're able to have a functional anarchic community is because actually the Promethean society is in a state of perpetual martial law. Yeah. And I, you know, I push back against this putative critique, but I do acknowledge it. And, you know, it says something important uh, that, that goes back to this ontology that Heraclitus embraced and that, you know, this, this theosophy that Zarathustra uh, originally elaborated, where conflict is central to the cosmos and is the motor of evolution and creation. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that type of thing is actually kind of like a burden to have to go through that. I mean, if you're in a society where everything's totally, you know, like free at this point, you can go any direction you want. You can go into deep space, deep cyberspace, you know, explore animals and stuff. The people who are going to be actually going to, you know, put themselves at risk, you know, it's it's a sacrifice at that point to have to be be there but i'm sure that there'll be people who will want to do that because as you were saying earlier you know well when currency is gone you know money is gone all that we'll have is like our reputation you know so it'll be like the star trek in that regard where the people join because they you know they understand there's a level of prestige that's involved and you have an admiral that's that's in the book and that's uh admiral hyrcanus isn't it so yeah i use this this idea of hyrcanus um, again, to to signal the heritage of Iran, you know, because there is a way in which the Promethean Navy that I'm uh, portraying in Artemis Unveiled is a legacy bearer of the Parthian Navy, the Cilician pirates of the Mediterranean who served um, Mithridates, uh, the, the king of the Parthian Empire, the emperor of, of uh, Parthia. And so there's this relationship between Iran and Prometheism in Artemis Unveiled, which is similar to the relationship between Parthia and the Cilician pirates, yeah. where it's not as if the Cilician pirates, I mean, they're pirates after all, right? It's mm -hmm. not as if they are literally the navy of Parthia, but they're working with Parthia in a way that's, uh, to say the least, in the mutual interest of each party. And so there is that kind of relationship, you know, between Iran in the mid to late yeah, 21st yeah. century and the Promethean pirates. Uh, and, yeah. And again, it goes back to what you write in Iranian Leviathan, which it talks about, you know, from that section on Hafez, where, you know, the, the true spiritual archetype of Persia is this uh, spiritual brigand. You know, this kind of like mafioso, like spiritual gangster, someone who like shuns, you know, like society so that they can be, you know, with the like the true religion, which would be love being able to do whatever that you feel, you know, inspired to do in that sense of that definition of love. And, you know, in that regard, like I like the that again, this the Promethean society has like the chaotic neutral element as well. And you talk like it's cool that connection between, you know, the 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 piracy of space, the Cosmo pirates. Um, and then, yeah, I really think that that again, um, your society, the way you're describing it actually has like a very strong archetypal uh, component. And it's fun because like you have the martial side and then you also have this Venusian side. And I say Venusian in the astrological sense where Venus, it represents abundance, pleasure and sex. And so, you know, you have like the male and the female, uh, you know, joining one another and, and being like they, they support one another. And um, yeah, I, I would have to guess that there would probably be a very strong level of integration between these forces too. Like, you know, because your work is all about this spectral revolution, you're you're breaking the the diet, you know, the binaries apart. Um, then you would probably not see uh, like like a strong divergence. Like there wouldn't just be like a cast of like warriors and everyone else is doing their own thing. It'd probably be a very heavily integrated like martial arts society, and especially because if we really want to be free, I think that we're probably going to be pushing people, you know, like I think that people's boundaries are going to need to be tested and need to be, because that's where strength will come from. You know, it'll come from the forge. It'll come from uh, the fire. And you're right to point to it as a kind of Venusian energy. And uh, you definitely see that in Artemis Unveiled as much as there's a vision of a 
militaristic society that is intent on defending the principles around which its community is organized, it's also a society of free love, uh, a society that's polyamorous, um, a society where there's been a kind of further sexual revolution that has everything to do with the spectral revolution because and the relation and the relationship between the spectral revolution and the technological singularity. Because, for example, in a world where I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, you know, uh, what I mean by this in a world where there's past life regression hypnosis as a standard part of the educational system. People will remember having lived, uh, you know, as many lifetimes as members of the opposite sex, you know, uh, as they as they remember lifetimes in which they had the same sexual embodiment. I mean, you see this in the research of Dr. Ian Stevenson, who did, you know, I don't know, several decades of uh, work at the University of Virginia studying uh, spontaneous past life recall of young children all around the world. And you see that there are many, many cases of the behavior of a of a person, of a young person being impacted by their at least subconscious identification with the sex of their previous incarnation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a society where past life recall of high fidelity becomes a common experience, you would probably have a more fluid sense of gender identity. And then there are going to be singularity level technologies from gene editing to nanotechnology that allow for a more fluid transformation of uh, biological morphology in terms of people's sex. Yeah, and yeah. So, so I think that the spectral transhumanism of that society will also express itself to some extent in the form of a spectral transsexuality. And that although probably, you know, male, female biological morphology will remain uh, the, the core structure of that society, there certainly will be uh, sexes other than male or female or some kind of a, you know, some kind of a um, transcendence of that binary, not just on a spiritual level, but as embodied through singularity level technologies. So that's, those are two ways, both in, in terms of past life recall and in terms of, um, you know, singularity level technologies that I think you're going to see another uh, sexual revolution take place. And then a third would be in terms of, you know, training to be able to control psi abilities. It's been noted by parapsychologists, particularly those who studied poltergeist cases, that poltergeist cases may not actually be the activity of some uh, discarnate spirit. They are likely instances of psychokinesis by a human subject uh, who's living in the environs where the poltergeist manifestations are taking place. And this tends to be a, a uh, young person going through puberty. And so it seems like the, and particularly adolescents that have complexes that maybe have gone through some kind of trauma, uh, they tend to be the people around whom poltergeist events occur so that there seems to be a connection between sexual repression and sexual complexes and unconscious manifestation of telekinesis. Well, this is really significant because if you're gonna wind up training your entire society from childhood to use its latent psi ability, not just telepathy, but also telekinesis or psychokinesis, you're gonna need to make sure that unconscious repressed drives are not driving those people to harm others using telekinesis. And so yeah, one yeah. of the things that I show in, in the educational system that I lay out in Artemis Unveiled is how basically from a young age, uh, 
uh, denizens of this society are produced who don't have any sexual repression so that these people will be more consciously in control of the psi abilities that are cultivated openly in this uh, society. I mean, it sounds great. <laughs> I definitely think that's pretty cool how you kind of like have written uh, like the sex into like the martial element. You know, the two, it's like I said, like you said, they really are very well combined, the martial and the the Venusian uh, together, you know, and so that we aren't, you know, living out our repressions, which, you know, seems to be what so many people are dealing with. I definitely see that point connecting to like Wilhelm Reich's work about the way that orgone energy works, the life force energy works, and how that type of energy, which is released during orgasm, you know, is really where there's like the key, like the chi, the prana, but the people who, you know, don't get to have like a very full release, it should be when you when you're going, it should be a full everything release. What happens is they have this thing called the body armoring, you know, and so they actually will like build up tension in their body to prevent the movement of the energy. So I feel like then if people have that, then what happens is, you know, they are prone to like to to sickness and then to attacks because, you know, if you're not able to like move like an octopus or something, you know, you're going to be hit really hard by whatever life deals you physically or in, in your real life. So yeah, having a system that helps people to be unencumbered by those reactions might get you some like Bruce Lee, you know, reflexes. Yeah, I mean, this is not on my part an entirely original idea. I mean, this was explored as early as uh, the 1950s film Forbidden Planet, you know, which uh, talked about the monsters from the id. It's a very colorful portrayal. <laughs> uh, the relationship between sexual repression and um, dangerous psychokinetic manifestations. Yeah, you know, and there, that that's something I want to go on to next, which was I, I do know that in the book, you talk about war against time itself. I wondered if you could kind of like elaborate on that because that concept was like, I heard that and I was like, I agree. And I want to know more. So, you know, as I've discussed in previous, uh, well, in previous interviews and as I've written in previous books, I think that time travel technology is not only feasible, it's been invented and that manipulation of space-time is part of the way in which we've been manipulated and controlled by these overlords, who I you know, alternatively refer to as devas or Elohim or Olympians, uh, that really we're in a fifth dimensional war with these people who consider themselves gods. And so, you know, war against time itself, well, it's a war against being ensconced by a timeline that's been determined by these overlords, right? So there's this yeah. image of Kronos in Greek mythology. Remember that Prometheus was originally a titan, and Prometheus turned on the other titans to help bring Zeus to power, only then to realize that Zeus is also a tyrannical dictator, right? And Prometheus defies the Olympians as well. Uh, but originally, Prometheus is a Titan, and the Titans are ruled by Kronos, the Lord of Time. And then in, in so, okay, so Prometheus first is a figure that is opposing the Lord of Time. Before he's opposing Zeus, he's opposing the Lord of Time. And I've drawn a number of parallels between the image of Prometheus and the image of Mithra mm -hmm. in the ancient Iranian religion. And Mithra overpowers the Lord of Time, which in Iranian, ancient Iranian is referred to as Zorvan. Yeah. Zorvan is Kronos, essentially. And so when I talk about um, a war against time in Artemis Unveiled, about a war against Kronos. Yeah. There's a very different conception of time, which you see in Heraclitus, which is that of the aeon. The aeon is living time, dynamic time, oh. rewritable time, revisable time, space time as a dynamic flux of becoming. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kronos is static time. 
Kronos is the, the uh, mythological figure that ultimately symbolizes fate and uh, you know, the, the way in which the human being is ensconced in a yeah. predetermined matrix of possibilities, right? which cannot be altered and which are encompassed by the mind of this god, this god Kronos or Zorvan or whatever. Right. And these uh, Olympians or devas, they in a way, in a way they are um, attempting to identify themselves as the agents of the will of this lord of time. They want to, they subscribe to this idea of the microcosm and the macrocosm, and they see themselves as sort of uh, the medium through which cosmic time is being actualized, right? In the illusory dimension of change that yeah. we humans experience. So they, they, you know, this whole idea of uh, lived experience as Maya or illusion and of reality, capital R, as timeless and ever perfect. Yeah. This, part of the ideology of these gods war against time is a war against that conception of time right makes sense I, I definitely i thanks for clarifying that that that's really cool um one of the other concepts that i came across in the book that i thought was super cool was this idea of uh like that future society the arts in that society they also differ very significantly from the Olympians because in that society, you know, they have started to like reintegrate like nature in a really amazing way um, where like the architecture of that society is like mimics nature in a lot of ways. You know, they probably have like tree cities or like, you know, bubbles that actually look like, you know, floating bubbles or something. And, you know, in, in that and then reversely you have what what the olympians did with their architecture you know and so i really feel like that contrast uh we could talk we could, i'm sure you'll say some great examples about that but the contrast between the two really goes to show that the promethean ethos is actually far closer in accordance with nature than what the olympians are presenting of like a kind of like a control structure like a dominate nature like all of nature was just made to serve mankind Whereas, you know, the Promethean mindset is that, you know, we're here with nature and they, nature does stuff that we can't comprehend or, or that is beyond us in some ways, like the octopus. You know, we're not just the only people here who have a significant story that's unfolding. Yeah, it comes back to how you conceive of the relationship between technology and nature. So uh, as I understand it and as I've tried to lay it out in my philosophical writings, technology is natural. In other words, technology is not uh, of a substantially different character than nature. Technology with its teleological force, with its goal directedness, its purposiveness, the way that it transforms biological morphology, and the way that it transforms society. Technology is a force of nature. Technology is what evolution looks like on the level of a conscious mind. And once you understand technology that way, there's no longer an opposition between technology and a nature that's dominated by technology. Right. There's a transformation of nature through this uh, <clears throat> conscious tool use and craft. Right, the craftiness of the human being and ultimately of the superhuman being is part of the evolution of life in the cosmos. And so I depict in Artemis Unveiled, you know, a style of architecture and a mode of inhabiting the world that's um, very organic, where you have, you know, buildings under the ocean that look like they're coral, and yeah. you know, you have uh, structures on asteroids that you know, at first glance look like they're natural, but then you realize they're artificial. And th there is just this very deep integration with nature, uh, a very kind of like organic and ecological style of architecture and engineering versus the way in which Olympian megalithic structures actually stand over and against nature. You know, people, like for example, the whole following of Graham Hancock and that whole circle uh, of people who are trying to excavate 
the legacy of Atlantis, they tend in that segment of the New Age community to portray the, the giant megalith builders as people who were in harmony with nature. But if you really look at these extremely high precision megalithic structures, they stand out very clearly from nature. And you know, part of the point of building gigantic polygonal structures of the type that we find in Giza or the type that we find blasted at Sidonia on Mars, the point of that is to stand out from nature. So yeah. that, for example, a spacecraft mapping the planet will immediately recognize, oh shit, humans built this. This is not mm -hmm. part of the natural environment, right? Versus the style of architecture that I portray in Artemis Unveiled uh, that blends very much into nature and into different ecological niches. So, so this is like a very ironic, you know, they, with their whole back to nature discourse, actually have a, a mentality of dominance over nature because subconsciously they see technology as substantially different from the natural versus the Promethean community that sees technology as an outgrowth of the evolutionary life force in the cosmos. A absolutely. I mean, and, and then the way that you describe the architecture, you know, it, it does kind of almost like exactly line up with what you're describing about the worldview of time where they think of like there's like this absolute reality of time. And so it's almost like they're trying to make an homage to like this fixed reality that's beyond the change of appearances. You know, as long as we have the mentality that the technology is that part of nature, you know, it's when we don't eat the apple for what it is, you know, when we shirk the responsibility of becoming the Superman that we then, you know, get addicted to our smartphones or something because we're not really ready to receive the kind of power up that's there. So we channel that power into something less than what it really can be for us personally and societally. Absolutely. Um, we've been put between a rock and a hard place. We have been, um, we have been captured by an engineered false opposition between on the one hand, a soulless mechanistic materialism in science and in the technology community, which then is framed as anti-nature and ecologically catastrophic by people on the other polarity, namely back to nature traditionalists, traditionalists who see uh, our technological development as the sin of basically human hubris against God as nature. You know, Deus sive natura, as Spinoza called it, right? God or nature, as you know, they used to write in the 17th, 18th century. Uh, so you have these two camps: the you know, Yuval Harari types, uh, Ray Kurzweil types, who are basically who've taken transhumanism, who've taken the inherently positive idea of superhuman evolution, and have presented this perverse warped, mechanistic, reductionistic version of it that disregards over a century of parapsychological scientific research. And this camp and the threat that it poses uh, both to the ecology of the planet and to the autonomy of the human individual, right, in terms of engineering some kind of hive-minded Borg uh, cybernetic species from out of humanity, the danger that it poses is being used dialectically to catalyze a traditionalist reaction that's Luddite, that's, you know, quote unquote, back to nature in the sense of nature uh, being opposed categorically to technology or technology being categorically opposed to nature, right? And so yeah. this false dialectic has been engineered. And I've written about how and why that's the case, going all the way back to Descartes and mm -hmm. how he was the agent of the Holy Inquisition. The whole, it, we are in a trap. Yeah. And, you know, we're in a vice that's crushing us from two directions. And Prometheism is that, uh, you know, logic that defies this binary. It is a movement that's outside of this false opposition um, and that is both pro-technology, technology as craft, as the creative force of innovation, and is also, uh, in, in, you know, ecologically aware and is embracing uh, you know, the biosphere and other forms of life besides humanity. 
that can have a part in that future society that I portray in Artemis Unveiled. And and now I think it, we're coming clobbered to the end of our conversation. It's been really phenomenal. And I thought, well, to wrap up, we really got to talk about Artemis and the moon. You know, like I really want to know, like, for instance, OK, so I wanted to just report something from Closer Encounters that you talk about. And it's that the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun and also 100 400 of the distance between the Earth and the sun. And then that's what allows for us to have perfect eclipses. And then you also have that the Earth is uh, orbiting around the moon at 27.322 days. And the moon is also like the exact 27.322 percent size of the Earth. And then the circumference of the moon by that of the Earth gives you a figure of, well, it goes to 436,000, 400, I'm sorry, million, 669,140 kilometers. And then dividing this by 100 yields 436,699 4, kilometers, a figure that matches the circumference of the sun to within 99%. And, and you have these synchronicities that are just unbelievable as they go on and on. And like, basically it's the fact that there's these, these perfect ratios that allow us to have these eclipses and the fact that the moon is perfectly rotating around us every moment, you know, like the way if I was just circling around watching you, you know, like that would be how the moon is. We never get to see the back of my head, you know, that would be that example. And so the moon is literally like this massive mindfuck, you know, it's what, if you look at what the moon is, I think that's like, I know, and it's associated with Artemis and the the thing about this this book is it's Artemis unveiled it has to do with the moon and it's that's the part that I wanted to hear from you your thoughts on you know why is Artemis associated with the moon so a number of things here okay uh first to go to go to the data that I had initially presented in closer encounters in great detail and which I summarize in much more casual form in this novella uh, you know, you don't even have to get into the really complex math to understand that the moon is an artificial space station. It is, as you said, uh, one four hundredth the size of the sun and one four hundredth the distance between the, you know, Earth and the sun. And this causes a perfect eclipse, a uh, solar eclipse. And the moon also has craters that are convex rather than concave. The bigger a crater is on the moon, the more you see that it, it curves up and out like a contact lens surface. And none of these craters uh, are deeper than a certain uh, uh, depth. In other words, the, all of the craters on the moon, no matter how wide they are, are relatively shallow and there's a certain depth which they never exceed, which seems to suggest that upon impact, any of these meteorites or asteroids or whatever, which are causing these craters are coming up against a hard shell. And the ejecta is revealing the convex surface of this shell, which shouldn't be the case. I mean, if an object hits very hard and it's a very large object, it should cause a really deep crater on the surface, a crater that's proportionally as deep as it is wide. And you never see that on the moon, okay? Furthermore, during the Apollo missions, NASA twice confirmed that the moon rings as if it's hollow. Acoustic signatures from an impact reveal a relatively hollow object. Uh, and that shouldn't be the case. And Carl Sagan himself actually commented on this, that it's terrifying because, well, it suggests that that's an artificial object. Even that skeptic, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, By the way, he knew things. There are some ninny skeptics like Neil deGrasse Tyson and so on and so forth. Carl Sagan wasn't one of those. He was on the inside, but that's a whole other story. There are things he said here and there about UFOs and about Psy and so on and so forth that showed that he actually knew a lot more privately than he was saying publicly. And he was playing some kind of a complex game. But be that as it may, so our, our, the moon is an artificial space station. Yeah. And yeah. in Artemis Unveiled, I talk about how the Promethean community ultimately attacks this space station. It's the opening scene of the book. 
the destruction of the lunar regolith and the revelation of the smooth spherical surface of this metallic satellite, this gigantic metallic satellite. And it's after the Prometheans take over the artificial space station from the Nordics, from these Olympian gods, quote unquote, that it's renamed Artemis Station. And it becomes an important part of the Promethean civilization, uh, this you know, Artemis Station hovering over the earth. Its relation to the goddess Artemis is that the lunar crescent in particular is associated with the bow of the huntress, yeah. right? So it's a symbol of the hunt. And you know, in, in some of the darkest parts of this novella, I get into how the uh, Nordics, the devas, are hunting and poaching humans from the moon. Oh. They are hunting souls. Mm -hmm. They have a psychotronic technology that's capable of grabbing human souls in the transition between death and rebirth and manipulating these souls from the moon. This is an idea that you see in a, a lot of ancient myths, the association of the moon with death, and that you see, oddly enough, in the work of Gurdjieff, who talks mm -hmm. about the moon as, as eating certain souls after death or eating a certain part of the human soul after death. And basically, I uh, describe how inside this hollow satellite is all this technology that's psychotronic in nature and that's used to manipulate people in the transition between death and rebirth, cause them to you know, forget their past lives and to be distracted and diverted from what might have been their own life's purpose and so on and so forth. And so in a negative sense, the moon is associated with the bow uh, the crescent moon, right, with the bow of the huntress, insofar as we've been hunted and poached by the devas for all of our history. Mm. And then in a positive sense, once the moon is captured by the Prometheans and becomes Artemis station, the moon becomes an important part of uh, our militaristic defense of the pursuit of our own destiny, of our self-determined course into the future. So again, like this armed space station is associated with uh, struggle in nature, right? Which we were talking about earlier, how Artemis, Arta Amesha, the idea of Arta, of cosmic order being associated with, you know, the force of Ahura Mazda in battle against Ahriman and so forth. This, um, idea of struggle as intrinsic to nature on the scale of the cosmos, that's also relevant to this armed space station as a key uh, asset in the Promethean war against uh, Olympian tyranny. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. And I almost feel like the idea of like the Artemis veiled before she's unveiled, she's veiled, represents like what you were saying earlier about how there is like this idea of there being a natural law. Like we veil the truth of the immor of the ever-changing fire. We put that veil over it because it's too intense for us. Or maybe, you know, it's almost been shielded from us at a certain level because we weren't ready for it. And so like, you know, some you actually you see this a lot with hunters, veils because that's actually a huge hunting tactic is camouflage, you know? So being able to take off the camouflage really, I think must represent then us being ready to lift that veil means we're ready for Artemis. We're ready to really love what Artemis, what Artemis stands for and, you know, and become hunters ourself. And, no. and, you know, so, yeah. like, there's a literal and a metaphorical level to this where, you know, and this is another important point that I, that I want to make about how this book is structured on a literal level, Artemis unveiled is, you know, the regolith being blown off the surface of this space station so that, you know, the truth of what the moon is, is unveiled. But metaphorically, as I point out in the novella, this uh, apocalyptic event of people witnessing the regolith being blown off the moon is an epitome of all kinds of other horrific disclosures which take place. Mm -hmm. over several decades. I, I uh, basically show how the Anglo-American deep state is destroyed in the course of the Third World War. And what that means is that 
people who were bound by secrecy oaths inside the CIA, the NSA, MI6, et cetera, they're all released from their secrecy oaths because the government that they work for doesn't exist anymore, okay? So after the Third World War and the Second American Civil War, which leads to the disintegration of the United States, you have all these secrets emerge from out of the deep state, you know, the truth about the JFK assassination, the truth about 9-11 and so forth, revelations which themselves are devastating. And so this is, again, Artemis, Ar Arta Emesha, immortal truth as a killer, mm -hmm. unbearable truths like arrows being shot by the crescent bow of the moon, arrows being shot down to the earth, shattering truths that the human community has to deal with and that collectively become another catastrophe in their own right. So that's that's another level of, you know, the meaning of the, the title of the book, Artemis Unveiled. Yeah, I mean, there are like that, like I said, your work, it always has these levels that are always like self-reflexive and they like build on one another. So like when I read it, I always are getting like more insights as I go on. I also had to wonder what could be more a horrific revelation than what we just kind of glanced over earlier. The moon is like a vampire system with the psychotronic technology being used to kind of like take people's souls. So you know, this book that we're looking at, Artemis Unveiled, is filled with such mind-shattering truths about what's going to come down the chute, what's happened behind us. You know, there's really no stability in that regard that even if you're doing a homestead thing like I'm doing and you're doing the prepping and stuff, you're still you're still going to be vulnerable if you're not considering that, like, at that moment, you know, of death, you could, you're still going to be having to be there with just your wits, basically, to kind of, like, assess the, the challenges that are going on. And it, in that, I can only recommend that people, you know, they spend their time reading Jason's works, uh, because nothing else in nonfiction quite compares to what he's done, you know, just focus on that. But then, you, you know, that Promethean mandala he shows with his coffee cup, that right there, yeah, it really taps you into this idea of of our of our success, of our ability to get through this. Because you know, you'll need something to kind of focus on when you do cross that veil at any time, whether it's tomorrow or whether it's you know 30 years from now when the devastations happen. So I really encourage everyone to you know focus and send their energies towards this idea of Prometheism as the Titan that defied the gods and gave us the ability to become even more than gods. You know. Yeah, as a closing remark, um, in response to the earlier things that you said there regarding the moon and thinking that you're going to somehow protect yourself by carving out a homestead somewhere in isolated wilderness. And by the way, this is exactly what's going to happen. I, I describe it in the book. Cities are going to empty out. The vast majority of people, at least in North America, are going to leave cities for a variety of reasons, cities are gonna fail and begin to crumble and collapse and people will abandon them for isolated homesteads in the countryside. Uh, but there's certainly not gonna be any fighting chance against the Olympians from that type of lifestyle. And no. so, you know, I depict this breakaway Promethean civilization that rejects that kind of retreat into nature, uh, which I think we're being prodded into by these devas. And ultimately, you know, this book is structured around the idea that we need to take the moon. We need to take the moon. Short of that, we need to put ourselves in a position where uh, we're the ones in control of what the moon has meant throughout human history. Hmm. And, you know, this goes back to Something that I think I think almost nobody picked up on uh, from Prometheus and Atlas. You know, Prometheus and Atlas, the opening quote of that book is from Gaius Caligula Caesar. It is a quote from Caligula, uh, in particular, uh, as portrayed by Albert Camus in his play about, uh, you know, this Roman Caesar. And it's about making the impossible possible and how that's the one real revolution in the world, the revolution to make the impossible possible. But if you actually go and read Camus Caligula, you see that at least as Camus has portrayed him, Caligula, this lunatic Roman emperor, is obsessed with capturing the moon. He wants the moon. 
And I put that there for a reason, and nobody seems to have picked up on that, you know, ever since. But it's relevant to why I've called this book what I have, Artemis Unveiled, and, and why the moon is so important to this narrative. Um, that thing is, uh, it, it's, it's hollow. The CIA knows it's hollow. Ingo Swan saw that. Other remote viewers have been sent to see that and to report on it in detail. Uh, they've seen it. I've seen it. I've described things that I know about it in Faustian Futurist. There are people up there, people in there, and they are bad news for humanity. And they intend to engineer a series of catastrophes in our world over the next several decades and emerge from out of the shadows as the stewards and guardians and so-called guides of humanity. And so ultimately, uh, you know, we're going to need to turn the tables on them and take control of the technology that they've used to manipulate and oppress us basically for our entire history, right? And yeah. what Atlantis was, as I understand it, and as I've written about it, you know, throughout, throughout my corpus, uh, Atlantis, at least the late phase of Atlantean civilization, was the first worldwide global attempt at a revolt against this mm -hmm. system. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm calling for a new Atlantis. I mean, that's why I named my first book Prometheus and Atlas. It's, it's about the Promethean rebellion of Atlantis and the revival of that, frankly, at a time when I think we now do have a much stronger fighting position than the Atlanteans did. Okay. Uh, we're in a position potentially to really prevail this time. Okay, and I, I totally think that's what we're, we, I agree wholeheartedly with that. Why do you think they let us get this far? I mean, is it greed? Was it, was it there's a hubris, you know, like they just didn't think we could get to it? Or do we have maybe some sides of, of this story that are, you know, keeping them from like tampering the timeline further, you know, because otherwise. Two things. Um, one is that there are two sides to this conflict. And I, you know, I got into this in detail in Closer Encounters, but I also discuss it in uh, Artemis Unveiled, this idea of the Ashuras, right? The Ashuras or Titans or whatever you want to call them, they're a, a class of beings opposed to the gods. Mm -hmm. In, in uh, Hindu mythology, they call the gods the Devas and the Titans Ashuras, uh, the Olympians and the Titans. And so this, this idea that from primordial times, from even before the creation of this version of mankind, you have this opposition between two classes of beings with godlike power. And so, you know, one of the interesting ideas explored in Artemis Unveiled is what is the relationship between these Ashuras and the Promethean movement? Because they're not identical, but yeah. there's a relationship there. And there's a relationship between these Ashuras and this super organism. Mm -hmm. And so one answer to your question is that there are two sides in this conflict. It's not simply up to the Olympians, whether or not the Italian Renaissance could take place, right? There were Ashuric forces that were also behind that and behind other uh, progressive leaps in human history. Another answer, though, to that, and you know, you can see this, for example, in Quetzalcoatl, the whole story of Quetzalcoatl and his conflict with Tezcatlipoca in the what becomes the world of the Mayans, that is a struggle between an Ashura leader and Devas. And you see it in the wars uh, portrayed in the Mahabharata as well, between the Devas and uh, you know, Indra as the leader of the, uh, between the Ashuras and Indra as the leader of the Devas and so on and so forth. And nuclear weapons were even used in places like Mohenjo-daro and Harappa and such. So, so one answer is that there's another side in this war, okay? It's a chess game, it's a cosmic game. And the other side, the other answer to your question is that there's such a thing as giving the enemy enough rope to hang himself with. The devas think that they're going to be able to spin this push for progress and technological advancement in a way that ultimately affirms their ideology and their plan for mankind. They think they're going to be able to use modern technological progress to teach a harsh lesson to humanity. Uh, as if we're children playing with matches. And then they come back in and say, you see what happens when you don't listen to us, your parents, and you burn yourselves. Don't play with these matches anymore. We're taking them away from you. The matches being metaphorical, obviously, for 
potentially destructive modern technologies. Yeah. And that goes back to the idea that maybe what they really want from us then isn't just like our slave labor. You know, you see this in a lot of different narratives in the past, like, oh, humanity was just created as a slave race to create the gold, which is like the elixir of life for them or something. No, they're actually, they want us, they're trying to persuade us. They want our consent. They need us to participate in the ritual somehow. Absolutely. And, yeah. They want our souls. Yep. Yeah. And they so want I get, us to want them. And there, and I show this in, uh, you know, I, I show this in Artemis Unveiled, and I also portrayed this in parts of Faustian Futurist. When they return openly, publicly, they will have created conditions where they're welcomed as saviors and guides and sagacious guardians of humanity. Yeah, yeah. We need, exactly. we need to start resisting that right now. We need to start developing a discourse and a, a strategy for resisting what is going to be, for many people, the irresistible seduction of accepting the guardianship and guidance of these beings, who, by the way, also are going to look like Nordic supermodels. And, you know, that's that's uh, going to be a mind fuck in and of itself. Um, yeah, that kind of beauty. And I think it has a lot to do with, like, the symbols that they use. If we're trying to really address it right now today, you know, becoming symbolically literate about the kind of imagery that's being used in the media. I mean, every single major media company almost has this reference to the the idea of like the moon, like the DreamWorks logo is like you got the, that's literally like a fishing off of the moon, like maybe for souls. Universal, it's like the perfect eclipse of the earth, like from the sun. You only would see that if you were on the moon, you know? And, and so basically, yeah, you know, they they are working to get us to to go along with that, which is why your book's so phenomenal, your books all together, because they are predicting that, you know, if this is true, you've laid out what they're going to do five steps in advance. So they're pretty much going to be treading in the footsteps that you laid out for them, you know, one after the other. So the books really are gold and dynamite like that. Hey, if that's true, at least we're prepared for it, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, I think uh, we're, if we go any further, we're going to be probably taxing the limits of our audience um, and, or, and or revealing too much of the book. Absolutely. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. It's and been totally awesome. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks again, Jeff. See ya. Thank you.